Hello. Um, in this module, uh, we will cover uh, fluid mechanics, what fluid mechanics is, and uh, also uh, what fluids are. And then uh, we will cover units and uh, dimensions. And at the end of the module, we will solve a simple example problem to demonstrate the concepts that we cover in this uh, module. But before we start, let me share my screen uh, with you. And we will go over my PowerPoint presentation or uh, notes uh, during this uh, module. So let me share this. And now you should be seeing the, yes, this should be a full screen. So uh, fluid mechanics is a, a discipline within the or under the uh, broad field of applied uh, mechanics. It's a natural extension of uh, the courses that you have seen, you have already taken before. Uh, basically, the, the courses are statics and dynamics courses and fluid mechanics is a continuation of these uh, courses. Uh, in fluid mechanics, we discuss uh, the, or we cover uh, the, the behavior of fluids uh, that are at rest or in motion. If it is at rest, we call it fluid statics. If it is in motion, then we call it as uh, fluid uh, dynamics. So um, now let's uh, discuss a little bit about what fluids are. Um, the basic definition of uh, fluids is uh, a fluid is a substance that deforms continuously when acted on by a shearing stress of any magnitude. Okay, so I'm repeating again a fluid is a substance that deforms continuously when acted on by a shearing stress of any magnitude. We will discuss a little bit about this uh, on a schematic very soon, uh, but before let's discuss also what uh, uh, you know the states of uh, matter. Uh, so matter uh, is traditionally considered uh, to exist in four states. These states are uh, solid, liquid, gases, and plasma states. But uh, most of the time, liquid, gases, and plasma states can be considered as the fluid state. So basically, we can consider uh, matter exists in two states, solid and fluid states. So to have a better understanding of what fluids are, uh, it is better to uh, compare uh, solids and fluids. And this will give us a better idea of what fluids are. Now, let's consider, uh, in this schematic, let's consider uh, two parallel plates. Okay, so, so this is the top plate, this is the bottom plate. So these, uh, and let's consider that we put a solid block, and let's say we glue it to the top and bottom plates, okay? And then the bottom plate is stationary, let's not move it, but the top plate, let's apply a force F let's say to the right. So because of this force F, initially the block, initial time is T naught. So the block is uh, solid, let's say it's a cube, rectangular prism, whatever that is, and we apply the force. So with time, uh, increasing time is T1 and then T2. So with time, the block will deform and uh, to some extent, you can see the dashed lines here, but it will stay the same with uh, time. It will not continuously deform, but it will deform and stay the same uh, as long as the force is constant for the rest of the time. But when we consider uh, the same setup, so uh, the setup is basically here uh, we have uh, to two parallel plates again, and this time between the parallel plates, let's say we put a fluid and we mark the fluid column here. Let's say we mark two fluid columns with a die marker to 
basically mark the boundaries of the fluid. And then we apply a force F to the top plate uh, and to the upper plate and uh, uh, the force is uh, towards uh, right or in the right direction. So you can see that initially time t naught, the, the uh, die markers are vertical and with time, as time increases, uh, you can see the deformation continuously increases. So at time t1, then t2, and if we have time three, then it would be somewhere here, time t4. So there is a continuous deformation of the uh, fluid. So that is the major uh, difference between uh, fluids and solids. And here, I also would like to very briefly mention that the fluids that are at rest, that are, uh, I'm repeating again, uh, correcting myself. So the fluids that are in contact with the boundaries will have the same velocity, same speed as the boundaries. So in this case, the bottom boundary has zero velocity. It is stationary. So the fluid particles that are in contact with the bottom boundary will have zero velocity. The top boundary will, be, uh, will have a finite velocity because we are applying a shear force. So the fluid particles that are in contact with the upper plate will also move with the velocity of the upper plate. This is called no slip boundary condition. And this is an important concept in fluid mechanics that we will revisit again. Now, let's consider, uh, since we have discussed about the differences between solids and fluids, now let's consider different states of fluid, liquids, gases, and plasma. I will skip the plasma state because in this course, we do not deal with uh, plasma. It is, uh, there is, uh, you know, applications to civil engineering is very, very, very limited for plasma state. Uh, so we are mainly interested in liquids and gases, and we will have um, perhaps more emphasis on the liquids uh, than uh, gases in this course. So let's consider the differences between uh, these two states, liquids and gases. So liquids are uh, generally incompressible. Liquids takes shape and side, uh, takes uh, shape with side and bottom. What I mean by that is, if you consider uh, this uh, water glass, I think you can see it in the screen, um, my water level is here. So water takes the shape of the glass. It takes the shape of the side of the glass, takes the shape of the bottom, and it also forms a top at the uh, uh, uniform level. So it forms a uniform free surface at the top level. Now, if it was a, let's say, water bottle, let's say these plastic bottles, and if it was completely filled, you can try to compress the liquid and you will see that you cannot easily compress uh, the, let's say, water bottle. So liquids are generally incompressible. Now, when it comes to gases, consider the, you know, that our water bottle, this plastic water bottle is now uh, filled with only gas. If you try to squeeze the bottle, you will be able to compress it. Okay, so that's why liquids are generally uh, compressible. And uh, when you consider that uh, bottle, uh, gases com covers the bottle completely. So gases fill uh, the space in the uh, bottle. So uh, there are uh, differences such as, for example, if you want to uh, drain the bottle, you would uh, pour the water out but if you want to drain uh, the bottle filled with gas, you would simply open the cap and then the gas will uh, escape. So those are some of the differences between liquids and uh, gases. So then the natural question is, why do we study fluid mechanics? Now, we need to know and understand the basic principles of fluid mechanics uh, to be able to analyze and design 
any system in which uh, a fluid is the working medium. Um, there are many applications of fluid mechanics in um, engineering disciplines, uh, typical traditional engineering disciplines such as mechanical engineering, civil engineering, biomedical engineering, etc. But also in um, disciplines such as medicine, meteorology, oceanography, and so on. So what are these applications? For example, if we want to design an aircraft, we use the principles of fluid mechanics. We use the principles of fluid mechanics in designing also automobiles, ships, or designing uh, civil engineering structures such as uh, bridges, such as skyscrapers, malls, uh, stadiums, shopping malls, and many others. There are many coastal engineering applications. For example, waves. We want to, uh, if we want to calculate wave forces, wave interaction with uh, coastal structures, sediment transport, and so on. So fluid mechanics has a wide range of applications in a number of uh, science and engineering disciplines. Now, let's uh, discuss about uh, dimensions and units. This is chapter 1.7 from your textbook. And um, let's first uh, define dimensions. Dimensions are physical quantities such as length, time, mass, and uh, temperature. Uh, dimensions are divided into two groups. Uh, we have primary dimensions and we have secondary dimensions. So primary dimensions are small group of dimensions from which all others can be formed. And secondary dimensions are uh, the uh, dimensions uh, that are expressible in terms of the primary dimensions. Sometimes we refer primary dimensions as the basic uh, dimensions. So um, let's now discuss a little bit about units. Uh, units are arbitrary uh, names and magnitudes assigned to the dimensions. They are used or they are adopted as standards of, uh, for measurement. Uh, there are many different types of units. Uh, there are many different unit systems. But in this course, we will consider only two uh, unit systems. These are SI unit systems and also the US customary unit uh, system. Uh, you're expected to know both of these unit systems equally well. We are more comfortable uh, in the US, we are more comfortable with the US customary unit system uh, in our daily lives, but in the engineering uh, uh, context, we use SI unit systems quite often. So in, a, in this course, you may have problems uh, with SI unit system or US customary unit system, and you're expected to uh, be able to solve problems in uh, either of these uh, unit uh, systems. So now let's discuss a little bit about, uh, well, I skipped this, I guess. So let's discuss a little bit about the uh, dimensions and corresponding SI and US customary units. Uh, in fluid mechanics, there are four uh, primary dimensions or basic dimensions. These are length, mass, time, and thermodynamic temperature. In this course, we will denote length with capital L, mass with M, time with T, and thermodynamic temperature with T. Um, for the SI units, corresponding to these dimensions, for length, it is meter, and for US customary for length is foot. And uh, for mass, the SI unit is kilogram, for US customary, it is slug. And here I want to make an important note. In the textbook, the US customary unit, primary US customary unit corresponding to mass is used as pound mass. Pound mass. Is, uh, now, I would highly recommend you 
in a given problem, whenever it is given in pound mass, convert it to slug immediately. And then solve the rest of the problem using the unit as slug. Okay. Um, we will discuss later on, but pound mass uh, is, although it may be, uh, it is also correct as uh, slug, slug will give you a lot of simplifications and avoid uh, confusions uh, in the uh, problem solutions. Now, the conversion rate is one slug is equal to 32.174 pound mass. So I'm repeating again, one slug is equal to 32.174 pound mass. So as soon as you have uh, the uh, quantity uh, given in uh, uh, pound mass, I would immediately convert it uh, to a slug and then solve the problem. Now, for the primary dimension of time, the SI unit is second, and also US customer unit is also second. Thermodynamic temperature T, the SI unit is Kelvin, denoted by K, and US customer unit is degree ranking. Okay, so you need to uh, know the conversions also for this Kelvin and degree ranking uh, to solve the uh, problems. Now, Let's discuss a little bit about the dimensional homogeneity. Um, dimensional homogeneity is for any valid equation that relates physical quantities, uh, the equation must be dimensionally homogeneous. What it means is that all terms in the equation must have the same uh, dimensions. So basically, whatever is on the left-hand side of the equation should have the same dimensions as whatever is on the right-hand side of the equation and including all terms separately. They should all have the same dimension. Let's give some examples for that. So the first example is Newton's second law. As you know, Newton's second law is force equals to mass times acceleration. Let's consider, so the dimension of force should be equal to dimension of mass times acceleration. That is what the dimensional homogeneity says. So dimension of mass is, as we have shown in the previous slide, it is mass. And dimension of acceleration is, remember acceleration is uh, length divided by time square. So this is the dimension of acceleration. So force, will have the dimensions of mass times length over time square. So this is the dimension of force. In SI units, we know that mass is kilogram, uh, length is meter, and time is second, so second square here. So the units for force in SI is kilogram meter per second square. And we call this unit as Newton. Newton to uh, uh, honor Isaac Newton uh, for this, uh, uh, you know, for his contributions in this field. And we denote Newton in short as the capital N. And for the force unit in US customary, mass is slug, length is feet, time is second. So we have slug feet per second square, which is uh, called pound force. So this unit combination is called pound force. Now in this course, instead of writing as pound force, I will denote it as only simply pound. I will not mention pound force because I will not use pound mass. If I use pound mass, I will specify it as pound, uh, pound dot, M, which will denote pound mass, and pound dot F denotes pound force. If I'm using pound mass, I will make the distinction by this uh, M or F uh, letters after pound. Uh, if I don't use pound mass, if I just simply say pound, 
you should understand it as pound force. So it's the force unit, not mass unit. Now let's consider a second example. Now let's consider pressure as the second example. As you know, pressure is defined as force per unit area. Uh, we know that dimensions of force is mass, length, or time square as here, and the dimensions of area is length square. So this will lead to uh, units of uh, pressure in SI as kilogram, meter divided by second square and all of them divided by meter square and we know that this combination is called newton so pressure has the units of newton per meter square and to honor the contributions of uh, pascal uh, in this uh, you know uh, field uh, in his studies on pressure we call this unit Newton per meter square as uh, Pascal. And Pascal is in short, we write it as PA. So Pascal, one Pascal is one Newton per meter square. So Pascal have provided uh, two very uh, important uh, laws regarding pressure. The first uh, law is pressure is uniform in all uh, direction. So pressure acts in every direction uniformly. And the second law of Pascal is pressure acts perpendicular to surfaces. So consider that we have a dam here. Uh, let's say we have water body here. Uh, water uh, body will exert pressure uh, on each of the uh, surfaces. So if you consider the bottom, the pressure forces will be perpendicular to the bottom. So which means that they will be vertical. And on the wall of the dam, again, pressure forces will be perpendicular to the surface. So you can see that uh, they will be uh, perpendicular to this inclined uh, surface. Now let's solve an example problem. This is a very simple, straightforward problem to demonstrate the concepts. Consider that we have a, a liquid in a container and we have a piston uh, that is pushed by uh, 500 Newton uh, force. We know the area of the piston is 2,500 millimeters square and we are asked to find the liquid uh, pressure. So here I would recommend you to stop the video, try to solve the problem on your own, and then restart the video and compare your solution with the solution that I will show uh, next. So we know that pressure is defined as force per unit area. Uh, force is given as 500 Newton in the problem statement. We know the area of the piston is 2,500 millimeter square. Now we want to convert this 2,500 millimeter square to meter square because pressure uh, is in terms of Pascal or Newton per meter square. So 2,500 millimeter square is converted to meter square by dividing uh, 10 to the 6. Uh, since it's in the denominator, we multiply here. Uh, so this will be in the numerator, 10 to the 6. This is the conversion factor between millimeter square and meter square. If you do the calculations, this will lead to 0.2 times 10 to the 6 Newton per meter square. We know that Newton per meter square is Pascal, so it is 0.2 times 10 to the 6 Pascal. And uh, we can represent 0.2 times 10 to the 6 Pascal as 0.2 megapascal. 10 to the 6 Pascal is megapascal, so this is 0.2 megapascal. Well, this is the end of the module. Thank you.